Uh, welcome to Weekend Walkabout. This is our fourth webinar in the Garden A to Z Weekend Walk and Weekend Walkabout series. Thank you for joining us. This is copyrighted material. Um, we've uh, put decades of our own lives into gathering the material that we present to people here. Uh, we love to share it with gardeners. We mean it for your personal use. Uh, if you decide that you'd like to share this with your master gardener meeting or with your tree, your community tree planting meeting, we'd like to know that. Just contact us. It's easy, easy to do off of the website. But we really want to know where it's being used and why it's being used. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so today our topic is improving the older garden. You're in charge. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Redesign and renovation comes due every five to ten years in established gardens and landscapes. Yeah. And uh, we've put together a lot of our, our best tips and a process that we follow when we're renovating a garden that we help will hope will help you get past the things that are the hardest to do, the obstacles, and, and maybe help you visualize your changes and in, in, in choosing plants so that you can make the garden look new again. Um, that's our business name, Garden A to Z, and so we have the website GardenAtoZ.org. It's a labor of love. Um, we also have GardenAtoZ.com, and you'll find our information right now straddling both, both sites. Both sites, but that's we're working on it. That's me. I'm Janet McConovich, and I started writing. Uh, I wrote my first book in 1990. I was teaching classes in 1988, so that makes me. About 30 years into doing this, my background's in education, but professionally I'm a gardener. I just found that it was wonderful to talk to other gardeners because you learn so much when other people talk to you about specifically what they're doing in their garden and you do the same thing. Steve, I do most of the words. And I do most of the pictures and, and some of the words. Yeah, right, we, we, we do cross over the both of us, but Steve's background is in photography. He's an excellent photographer. So when we can afford to have someone go out just to take pictures, it's Steve. Mm -hmm. I do carry them. It's fun. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good to do. But uh, we love to write. We decided to put everything into one place so that we wouldn't have to keep writing the same information over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's, that's us. And our, our, our livelihood comes from working in gardens. Our love uh, and passion extends into teaching and helping other gardeners, which we've done for a long time. Um, that's our website, both Garden A to Z and Garden A to Z dot com and dot org. Both look the same. Uh, we're, there's no advertising. There's no uh, fee for you to, to use our information that's there. Uh, we are supported primarily by us and by the people who read our stuff who like to help out. What we do is we put information into articles and then we file the articles under things like our big mistake uh, category or things we learn from mentors and mentors magic. Uh, things that are happening uh, timely for the week and this week in our gardens. We put those articles in there and then every week or so we put those together into what we call an ensemble weekly edition where you can um, read the summaries of articles that are particular to that time and you can uh, click link to them. That's all on our website. There's thousands of pages, thousands of articles there. And uh, there are articles that we put up because we think that they are not being done elsewhere. We, we put those things up that we think, this is hard for people to do. It's hard for people to cut that much out of a plant in order to get it back down in size and get it to thick up, thicken up, which is what it did. And as you see in the picture on the other side, um, we write for people how to do it, um, what you're gonna face, what the plant looks like the next year and the year after that. Um, because we think those are the things that gardeners need more than anything else. So that's the kind of articles that you'll find. And today, talking about improving older gardens, we're going to speak from our own experience in improving older gardens. And that doesn't mean gardens that are that are neglected. Neglected or bad. But this is a perfectly good garden you're looking at right here. One of the relatively weed free. Yeah, uh, for one for of the premier gardens in in our area, which happens to be in Michigan, although we do work in other areas too. And we renovated it um, to do. Uh, to do this. Now it's different and you might notice different things like the wood that we put across the back, um, the spaces that we made in it, but what we really want you to notice is that the light is on, it's become night. These things take time and we're going to tell you the amounts of time that it takes so that you can realistically plan for yourself, how much can I do out there? 
We hate to see gardeners go out and find out that they can't get done what they want to get done. Discouragement is not a good garden. It's not a good way to garden, to yeah. be frustrated. Yeah. And bad. Yeah. So. so the garden does, it It was a perfectly good garden, a healthy garden, but it gets to the point for one reason or another that it needs to be redone. And then you make it different, not necessarily the best, because there's no best garden. It's just an ongoing process. And eventually this one will be changed. Changed again. That's the way that it goes. Um, you can download, or you already have downloaded, our, the notes that we'll be showing you throughout the meeting today. Those notes are available on our website, GardenAZ.org. If you go there and search webinars, you'll find our webinar folder that has our, our things in it. Cool. Um, what we're taking you through today then, and starting with those notes, is that it, we, you need, we think you need, we certainly think we need to follow a game plan that starts with facing reality in the very first step that says, most people think, oh, I can't take that out, and totally gets in the way of any kind of renovation if you say to yourself, I can't move that, I can't move that, I can't move that, because you yes. can. Yes, you can. Anything can be moved, and everything should be moved in many cases. So we're going to take you through four steps. If you can get past that point where you're saying, I can't take it out, if you can get past that point, then you can come with us to assess the plants that you've got, free up some space, check and restore the growing conditions, and replant. And we're going to take you through, you'll see those on the first two pages, the first okay. circle there. Um, yeah, if you have the handout. So assess the garden, make some free space. We'll take you through that one at a time. And we're all doing this already. Gardening is a process. Gardeners go out it's, and change things. It's not staying. It yes. can't be. Everything is always changing, and it's better if it changes. You might start with this garden, and then where this garden is here, you say, you know what, I'm going to do something with all that sod I'm digging out in various places, and you stack it up and make yourself a rock garden over there. Now you've got a rock garden over there, and you move back over to the other side and go, hmm, maybe, maybe some native wildflowers in that area right there. And that's kind of neat. We'll keep that for a while. And then you decide you want a water feature, and it becomes a water feature area. This is what we do. What we're talking about doing is when a place actually needs to be um, made new again because the plants have worn out or because you've gotten tired of something. Um, we should all be enjoying our gardens all the time. Every Today. Every day is, is wonderful in a garden. Yeah, every single day. Ah, oh, we loved our pond. Miss it. Yeah. Um, and the plants need it too. This is our native New England aster, and that aster needs to grow and become bigger year by year. It needs to become new. To renew a garden, to renovate a garden, is to take the plants and give them the chance to be new and young again. So we start with assessing what's there. And that means you're going to look at the plant species, at its health, and at its location. We're going to start off with species. Which means? What? <laughs> that you have thousands of species to choose from. This is a And that you need to know what the species is. You have to know the plant that you're getting and, and its cultural needs and everything. Right. If you look at that and say and it's... That's rhubarb. That's good. If you know that it's rhubarb, you can look up rhubarb, you can know how big it's supposed to get, what it needs, what eats it, what diseases it gets. If all you know is that it's the big leaf plant that Aunt Mel gave you, you're never going to be able to compare it to somebody else's rhubarb. And not figure, figure out what's the problem, right. because you don't know what it is, you if can't, there's a problem. You can't assess a plant without knowing what it is. So the first thing is figure out what they are. And if you know you yeah. have a plants with problems that are not performing the way you want, these are blue hydrangeas, they never bloom, they're struggling, why? Yeah. Why are you keeping them? Yeah, once you looked up hydrangea macrocephala on a, um, on a macrocephala, macrophylla, on a website like ours or others, it would tell you they do not bloom reliably in the Midwest. They bloom on old wood and it and gets And the old frosted. wood needs to stay alive in the winter, which it doesn't in the Midwest. So if you know by the species that, well, it's not me, I'm not doing something wrong, it's just the species. You can say, I'm gonna get rid of those. There are better plants I can put there. Well, it's instead of just one species, now you have a lot of different elements. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can have more things going on. And, and please do throw them out. If it turns out that it's not the plant for your place or for you, don't find another place to put it. Just throw it out. So you, you know what they are first. Make sure you know what they are. Right. And then you can say, what's, what's its health? 
What does it look like? How is it doing? Is it truly healthy? Are you just remembering what it used to look like? That, that orange plant is the orange perfection fox that rarely gets a mildew. This is a seedling that came up from it, and it just well, science sorry. It just get it got the mildew. Now you say, wait a minute, mildew is always those uh, gray grayish leaves with white spots or something like that. That's instant kill mildew. That yes, was, mildew is, was so heavy. This is mildew so heavy that it killed the leaf before the mildew gave it had a chance to, to produce its, its gray white spores. So, you know, that plant is not a good plant. It's not healthy. It's not going to be healthy. So why would you keep it? And it's, it spreads, helps spread disease around more. To, That's right. Having typhoid Mary around is not yeah. good. In, uh, in a different garden here, and this is a seaside garden, uh, a summer home, this plant is euonymus. It's a uh, yellow leaf euonymus because the owner's theme is to have yellows and blues out there. But it's not a happy plant, and it's never going to be a happy plant maintained in a little tiny space like that and constantly cut back. Constantly. Cut back. Constantly. It's not healthy. It's not going to be healthy because it's stressed. It gets the problems that its feces get. So you'd say to yourself, not healthy. I'm not going to fight with this plant anymore. In another garden that we renovated last fall, these are peonies. They've been there for 12 years. They're quite healthy. They've been serving very well. But now we're going to renovate and redesign this garden because it's got a new walkway that's moved further out. We have the opportunity to showcase these pe peonies in a different way. They're healthy. They're doing well. We can keep them. And move. move them someplace else because move. right now they are where the blue, where the where the blue line is. We're going to move them out. We're going to move them further out. Give them a little more room. Right, because we can use them to showcase something else. And so we did move them. They're at there's four peonies, and they're all well. There were three originally. We added the fourth one. Um, they're now moved out to where the stakes are and cut back for the winter. And then we assess all the rest of the plants. We go down the line and say, you know, the rose is pretty good. We could use that. We're not saying we're for sure we're going to use it, but it's in good shape. We can dig it up and use it. And, and the annuals can be exchanged anytime. Here or there, yeah. They'll yeah. say, do they grow well? They grow well. Um, this castor bean, as impressive as it is, we know what castor bean should look like. This plant should be eight feet tall, and each of these leaves should be as big as a saucer sled. Well, I'm not sure that doing... this is really what we want to have it do here. Uh oh, okay, only one of us should be doing the clicker, huh? <laughs> you do it okay. right. We put lot way when we renovated this whole front bed here, we uh, we kept over half of the plants that were there, but we added new things that um, would help fill the new space, show off what was already there. It's exciting to be able to do that. But this is all replanted. We won't be able to show you the after picture because this is just waiting to come up now. As we got down to this area. We had a bunch of plants that most gardeners do this. They walk by the place that they see the most and they stick plants in it. They stick a plant in and they stick another plant in and they stick another plant in. So we were looking and saying, yes, it's a nice plant, but is this where it belongs? And that we'll get to in location. But in the background back there, you'll see that empty spot used to be a whole mess of hostels. The spot in back of the yeah. boxwoods. And if you look at this picture from years past, about five years before, there's that hosta, and it's there behind the boxwood, and it's looking good, it's as good as all hostas get. Um, and as time went on, it looks like that, which is not, it's still healthy, but it's enormously big and not being good for the health of the plants that it's leaning all over and crowding out along the way. <laughs> am, I, am I clicking, or are you? There we are. Okay, so there's a hosta. I've cut it down now, getting ready to divide it and to dig it out so that we can um, renovate the area and renew the soil. Its crown is there. And in that area, I'm going to lift this hosta the way that I lift big things. I'm going to take that crown and divide it as if it's a pie. I'm going to take a pie shaped slice out of it and lever that out first, and then cut the rest into pie shaped slices and take them out. It's much easier than trying to lift the whole plant, and you need to divide it anyway. You can get the middle out a lot easier doing it that way, yeah. too. Look at the outside stems that I've cut down and how much bigger those stems are, bigger in diameter and better in color than these that are older and on the inside part. These are 
Uh, they're crowded and small. Crowded, small. They've been there long enough that they are going to have more disease spores and insect damage on them. You're going to get rid of the middle and plant just a quarter of the outside of that hosta. Hmm, didn't go forward. There we go. A lot of times it helps to go back in your memory. Do we actually remember what they look like in the past? This is five years ago. So you can look at your garden and go, yeah, five years ago, the uh, hydrangea was down blooming and down below the, the numbers. The hostas were there, but not overwhelming. Um, and I had uh, various things that we put in here that looked pretty good. But three years ago, despite the fact that we cut this hydrangea all the way to the ground every year, it's now gotten so big and wide that it's coming covering the numbers. And the hostas are beginning to lean on everything. Now. And get big. Yep, and now they're like that. <clears throat> so then we're going to go and say, assessing this, we know what species they are. We've made some determination for whether they're healthy now. Are they in the right place? Coming around the corner of that garden, here's Crocosmia. A good five feet tall, sometimes six feet tall when it blooms and leans. It's wonderful for hummingbirds, but does it belong right at your front walk, right where the walk used to come right across there? Um, probably not. And leaner. No, it's quite the leaner. It's all staked up here. Um, a daisy is in here, right at the front edge. Daisies are gorgeous when they bloom, and they are shabby at best, and sometimes embarrassing uh, yeah. after they get done. Might look blue. like some of us after our quarantines are over <laughs> without haircuts. Without haircuts, yes. Um, when you are lifting something big, evaluate the entire situation before you start digging hard. The, the size of that grass, it goes right up against that building and that building's all shingles and siding. And if you go to lift it, and it could actually rip that siding. That's right. If you lever it. this whole thing out of there with the roots doing what they're doing, it could pull the siding out. Even if you're slicing it, be careful. All right. Now, this is that same bed with the Iwanis that's not healthy and we've decided to take out. This location is not great for this miscanthus because it's right here where people walk by in their bathing suits and the edges of the grass on the scanthus are will shot you. Um, and it's big. It leans on the, on the lawn. So we're going to take it out. And just like the uh, hosta, we're not going to try to level the whole thing out. We're going to cut a pie-shaped piece out of it. And start from the outside edge and angle your, shell, your spade down in and if, if when you first hit it, it doesn't go right in. That's right. You start on the edge and you take a nibble out of the edge and then you move in further. And Because people say, oh, I try. Well, you, you have to be patient and cut from the edge. Once you get that first pie-shaped piece out, the rest of it comes out a lot more easily. It's like the plant said, oh, wow, you yeah. got me. Yeah. Got about 20 square feet here in this bed. And it took two hours, a little over two hours, to clear everything to get the grasses and the alarmists out. And of that time, 40 minutes was getting that one grass The out. far end one. And then it took about an hour, a little over an hour to replant it with smaller grasses, yeah, bluer grasses. So now it's bluer, smaller grasses, shorter grasses. They don't um, encroach on the wall. I didn't think I did that. I didn't. I must have moved oh, my mouse around. Mine is off. Okay. No, it's not. When you press it, it'll work. Yeah. Okay, so when you're looking, think about that in terms of time. 20 square feet would probably be from section one of the of the uh, fencing here to section two. And there's say. probably 30 sections of 30 fence. sections in this. This is at the Betty Ford Alpine Garden in Vail, and uh, it's a lot to renovate. You wouldn't want to try to tackle the whole thing at once. You'd say, you know, I can do that in, in a day, in a half a day. And you are going to want to do chunks big enough that they make a difference. So think about how long it takes. Yeah, and it's important to realize. To, to realize that there's thousands of plants that you haven't grown. Our client came and said, what are we going to do new this year? And, and Janet evaluated the areas. And this corner here, as we looked at it with her, it has, it, it doesn't have anything special in it. It has the same plants that she has throughout her gardens already. Why don't we do something in this area? And she went, oh boy, yes. And the next thing we knew, we had a new a, a bench new, to figure out where the bench, bench to work with. And, and a place to put lots of new plants. New plants. So we removed some pines and, and dragged. It might, it might have been me. We dragged the wood out this of the, here. it was uh, one trunk, but we dragged it out and split it up and, and made it a, a 
place that kind of gives a sense of space. Plus, it gave us area to plant a lot of woodland wildflowers into that, the rotting wood, into the wood and around it. Yeah, and we got to use different different things. We took out that crab apple and, and some of the pines. And it takes a while for it to make this change, you see. Ah, you do, do, don't have to click, or do you yeah, we do have to click. I'm not touching it. Excuse us while we while we uh, fight with our high technology here. Yeah. So we we uh, we made the, the place better by bringing in new things. Some of the plants went to her children, who also garden. Some of the things went out into the compost. But we ended up by taking out the crab apple and out the pines, making room for a nice new Japanese maple and false cypress and all those woodland plants that grew in that area. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes the gardens, that must be you. Must have been me. Yeah, sometimes the gardens are big. This garden, you can walk and walk and walk along. And it was time to renovate it. You, you have, this is where the discipline game plan comes in. There's my paper laying on the lawn out here. As I've walked, I've marked down which plants are there, which ones I think we should keep, where areas are that we need something, and what the, what the new something would be, where we're going to move a plant. If you don't, Pay attention to what you're doing, just a suction at a time. You can't really take on big cards. And, and you need to write it down. You remember it better. Even, even if you take photographs of, of those sections and say, I could take this out, take this out. That's right. Are you going to remember exactly which one is where? We do a lot of our design work. Um, Steve, I think I might have been you. Uh, we do a lot of our design work. I, I apologize. I apologize. We shouldn't That's, be switching. We do a lot of our design work in the winter time, and it helps to have pictures to remember what we saw growing there. Yes. So when we got done, the uh, the bigger picture on top is once we got done. The smaller picture is what was there before, and the differences are in the colors of foliage and the amount of space for the plants that we want to show off. Um, one of the biggest changes is that uh, I got rid of some of the grasses. We had enough grasses, and moved to the big um, uh, morning light grass back so that we could plant smaller things in front of it. I also got rid of the dark foliage barberry. We had barberry elsewhere. We didn't need any more dark foliage and put in light colored um, gold leaf plants. This is a gold leaf caryopteris. There are other changes in there, but those are the bigger ones that, that started everything else off. That the grass is good, it's healthy, its location isn't good. Let's change that. That this plant is good and it's healthy. But it's not the kind of plant that we want to have there. And as yeah. you proceeded down the areas, it was we changed some of the same else. things. Looking at this middle area, we were adding more color. They wanted more color, wanted bulbs. Excuse me. And uh, if you look at where the boulder is, that boulder is there. That's where um, yeah. I specified. Excuse me, it's, I don't know where this it's is. It's design going. part, and I'm not as good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Steve, Steve tends to avoid the design, the sign questions. He's got a great eye, he really does. So anyway, barberries are gone, and some of the grasses are gone again in this area in order to make room for more color. Now on the far end, after we got done, so the bottom, again, some grasses are gone and moved around. More colors put in, the barberries we cut back to smaller there. Um, we no sooner got done, well, five years, and said, boy, it's looking good now. Mm -hmm. And we had another change. You might not even recognize that it's the same area. Lost. The background is gone. The spruces oh. were not particularly healthy, but were going downhill, and the owners decided to take them out. There's the sump. So, oh, you know, it's time to renovate again and for a reason that we didn't really anticipate. And there were two more. Yeah, we lost two that more. were there. There and one more further over. I asked the clients to please leave the stumps. I needed to excavate to see what had happened to these spruces. So I've now excavated this area. I'm and down the full depth of the trowel plus the handle. And there, down there, is where the wide, the, the very thick flare roots are. This is the level that the tree should have been planted at, but it was planted deep. It's probably grown deep. And these roots have developed adventitious roots. So adventitious oh. roots. And these roots growing in that soil above the flare have wrapped themselves around the trunk and are preventing the trunk from growing. 
And there could be stuff going on even farther down that we right. didn't even notice. But now that we know that that's what happened, we know that we could plant another spruce if we really wanted to and make sure that the spruce gets planted at the right level. And we also know that the spruces that remain, here's one of the ones that remain, have the same problem. See the roots wrapped around the trunk, that trunk is not going to be able to grow for very much longer. And it does, it strangles the tree. Yeah. Come back uh, for our webinar number six, six, because we're talking about that problem and we'd really like everybody to know about that. Um, we, we intended for the, uh, the cat, the catnip to stay up on the hill. Yeah, the catnip likes to wander. Yeah, it does indeed like to wander. And some plants wander underground. The catnip was moving by seed. Yeah, and these are, these are reasons to renovate because you lose plants because plants move around. But once you've decided what your keepers are, because it's healthy, it's the right species for what you're doing, its location is good, and you've decided to keep that tree. Now that might sound like a extreme thing, but sometimes you decide to take trees out. This one's mm -hmm. extremely important. It shaded the backyard and the house. It's the only, this is a west, west and south facing garden, it's the only thing that kept it cool. We did have an arborist we, um, trim it in order to limb it up and make sure that we had uh, good wood on it. But then, and this is, this is almost 10 years into this garden um, that you're looking at here. That patio was, was right not uh, dug down and then into the roots, right. we, we elevated did, it. We did not dig into the roots on that tree. We built the patio above the roots with a porous um, surface. We put a, a, a um, a slag surface with a curve around it so that we would not be damaging tree roots. Um, these hemlocks, the client really likes. In fact, she went out and got two more hemlocks and she wanted the more hemlocks. She wanted to extend the hedge, but she also wanted us to prune the hedge to make it thicker. And we said, you know what it is? It's this button right here. Mm. Maybe we'll switch. And I'll let you do this button. There we go. Those of you who uh, know me for and known us known me for a while, and so what it is is when you roll that on the button. top, is that I have a tremor in one hand, and it's a little easier for me to use some tools than other tools. So anyway, you can't trim that, but you have the pointer knob, which is oh, sticking in the middle, and shouldn't, it shouldn't be just hanging. Okay. Um, you can't prune them to make them thicker. They're the they're the thickest they can be at the amount of light that they've got. But if you want this area to be thicker. You're going to need to trim that tree. You need to bring in more light. Those new ones that you brought in that look nice and thick look that way because they were grown in a sunny field. So um, you need to figure out what your keepers are and then you're going to need to make the, the conditions right for them. And you need to protect them. If the hawthorn is important, you may not want to dig all the plants out from around it when you're renovating. You might want to kill by smothering so that you don't disturb the tree's roots too much. In this place, they uh, wanted some to change the front, and we told them, well, the, the spruces are going to get much too large. Oh, really? They really like the blue foliage, and so we finally convinced them that we could take those out and, and renovate what's going on over here, and we did. And we left one plant that, from everything that was there before in its spot. It's a dogwood. It and had enough room to grow. It had the most it was root healthy. space. It, it, it would bloom a good color for their, their um, uh, con contrasting color that they use as a pink to go with their blue. It's a good plant. And everything, once we decided that that was the tree that would stay and that it was in the right place, it meant that everything else that we started with in the area. Everything. It was uh, two hemlocks, one, two, three burning bushes, numerous uh, Euonymus, some ground cover, and uh, Japanese maple, and a dogwood. All together in one spot. So once we decided the dogwood was going to be the one to be the keeper, it meant that when the client said, can we save the others, we said, we'll save the others, but not at the expense of the dogwood. We'll save them as best we can. Right. If we're going to dig given that, that the dogwood's got to survive. That's right. If we're going to dig that Japanese maple out, we're going to dig the Japanese maple, cutting its roots, rather than cutting the dogwood's roots. And because we've worked with a lot of roots, you can tell the roots apart even. Sure you can. Yeah. And, and we did, most of them did make the move. And they all got moved into there. There are other places. That was rolling that little thingy. Yeah. Okay. 
So we moved the, the, the uh, Japanese maple out, and you'll see that again at another time. If you've sure. decided that the hostas are going to stay, then the vinca must go. You can't say, you can't say I'll keep some of the vinca, the myrtle, it's vinca minor, because the plant is the wrong plant. It's going to overwhelm the hostas every time it gets a chance. So it has to go. You can't say I'll leave a little bit of it. You take out all of the plant. That or you just said that the house is right. She wanted more color on her front walkway. I said you need less vinca. You don't need more of anything. That vinca is moving. It's going to be lapping at your front door in no time at all. It's just an outline to help you visualize what you've got there. I didn't do that. Okay. So I don't have an after of this garden for you. This is a couple that uh, came to our design class at the Oldbrook Botanical Gardens. And one of these days I'm going to look them up so we can see what they did. But I want to tell you the kinds of things that they were deciding. What do they keep? What don't they keep? I said, what do you like there? What's, what's good to have there? Um, they have a, a Japanese maple. Oh, look at that. They have a Japanese maple here. They have a false cypress over here and another false cypress. They like those. Um, I said, well, that's good. I said, and, and whose rocks are these? Well, he likes the rocks. And let's put the rocks on the edge. And the rocks are important? Oh, yes, he likes the rocks. Um, I see that somebody likes contrast, bright contrast between red and white, red and yellow. Yep, yeah, that she does. So, well, let's look at what you've got here. You have a lot of lines in your garden. You have the line of the fence. You have the line of your hostas. You have the line of your annuals. You have the line of your rocks. And all of those lines line up from left to right across your field of vision like this, there is also, not shown in this picture, a line of utility wires going across there. Your lines are all emphasizing something that maybe you don't want. Maybe you've got a triangle up here of these three plants, but everything else is lined up. So let's look, look, look first at what you've got, which you can do yourself. Take, Take a, a picture, picture, put a piece trace. of tracing paper on top of it, and trace the lines that are the most outstanding ones. And you can then erase by not tracing the things that you can, are, that are movable, like your hostas, et cetera. So we looked at that. So that's what we've got. Why not bring the rocks into the center? They are the right plant. There's something, <laughs> the right material. There's something that you like. And let's put them into a line that's not a straight line. Let's put them into a zigzag dry stream bed right in the center. Or if you don't like the zigzag, to come straight down. But let's not have another line that goes across. So now we've got some time for questions. And those of you who are listening as, uh, as a, uh, a uh, recorded storm, we, the questions are not going to be here today. Uh, you can find them on our website and we'll write them up, but we're not going to include all of the questions today. Just some pretty pictures to look at as we tell you that people asked about renovating lawns. Um, and one of the big things on lawns is that when you're renovating a lawn that's getting thin under trees, look up and think about thinning the trees. Lawn belongs in the sun. Another question that we got was about whether or not we could. Um, uh, get rid of vinca myrtle? I said, yes, we can, and we'll talk about how we get rid of that in just a little bit. Aren't they beautiful? They take gorgeous pictures, Stephen, even when they're strange pictures. <laughs> okay, so you've assessed the garden, now you have to make some free space. You've got to have free space. It's like playing with that little game that has the numbers, tiles in it that you can move around. If it doesn't have an empty space, you can't move anything. So you're going to have to lift some plants out. You're going to have to deal now with those aggressive perennials and weeds. Move some things and need to talk about holding areas. So here's where we are. We've made it all the way down two inches on your paper. Yeah. This is our, uh, our previous house. We moved from here three years ago. We miss it terribly, but there are reasons to move and, and there are reasons to move. We loved it. We patterned it after meadow, prairie gardens, like at the Powell Botanical Gardens. And it was just what we wanted. But one day, standing across the street, looking at it from Phyllis's house across the way, we realized it's, it's not as pretty from over here as we think it is. It's time to renovate. Things have gotten a little out of hand. So the next spring, we took apart the middle of the garden, this area right here. Because we couldn't take apart the whole yard all at once, but we could take apart a big enough section and plant it with low enough plants that there would be a restful area in it to be seen from Phyllis's point of view. So you're going to be looking at making some free space. You're going to designate a space and say, where can we get rid of things? In this garden, when we started, it was full of cacosandra, some sickly rhododendrons, some sickly crab apples. And looking at them and their health and where they are, we ended up with nothing 
except the uh, Boston Ivy that grew in the corner. Um, really, that's all that we kept yeah, in the garden. I really think so. Yeah. Yep, that's all that we kept. So sometimes you get a lot of free space. It's a gorgeous garden now. It's just what the owner wants, and it's just what we love to look at. Uh, but it took biting the bullet and saying, really, we're going to have to dig out that pack of sand. As much work as that is, it's got to come out. Because we can't keep a, you can't keep a little pack of sand. Pack of sand doesn't really little bits. No. Uh, the ivy became a problem. The owner liked the ivy, and then the owner didn't like the ivy because the ivy is covering windows and laughing over the roof, and we'll work on the ivy now. Making some free space at this garden that we did last fall for Sue was fairly simple. Sue put in a new walkway that the new walkway further out bought us some room. Um, it bought us some room that happens to be where the old walkway used to be, which means that the ground is not great there, but it's that's free space to work with. Which is why we could move the peonies out. Um, in some cases, we made free space by the hostas are just too big. They need to go back down to the size that they were to start with. So we cut them down, divided them, gave us, uh, gave us uh, uh, the plants around them a chance to grow again. Uh, now, in doing this, and I, we told you we were going to tell you about time, uh, we dug first where the peonies were up to this area where the castor bean plant is, and then we dug from there outward. The amount of time that that took was about nine, uh, about nine hours to get here at this spot where the castor bean plant is from the right, and then it took us oh, close to, uh, let's see, what's 23 minus 9? <laughs> it took us about twelve, uh, about 14 hours with a helper to finish the rest of the area. Um, what it works to is the same number that I keep coming up with for renovations. It happens to be longer than putting in a new garden. It takes about 10 hours for 100 square feet. So we've got a little over, we've got about 240 square feet here. It took us 23 hours to take care of it. So think about that when you're putting things together. But that's how much time it's going to take. Steve sometimes argues with me. He said, okay, well, that's not. Not anymore. He said, that's not a 14-hour area to do the hosta area that you see there as well as the area that I've dug over. Um, I always think it's more. Right. He always says, that's just you, Janet. You work faster and different. But we've had a lot of people working for us over the years, and we've worked with a lot of people. And the numbers, the numbers hold true. They hold true. Yeah. They really do. Even I don't work at her pace, but we're really close. Yeah. Um, the hostas, I, we know about big hostas. It takes a half an hour for one of those hostas to, to dig it up, divide it, yeah. put it back in again. 40 minutes for the big grass, 30 minutes for a hosta. It's going to take you time, and you need to be realistic so that you can get done and not feel discouraged. Yeah. When you're uh, uh, estimating your time, Look at those big Look plants that are in there. Mm -hmm. And also think about whether you've got aggressive running root perennials like uh, gooseneck or ground covers that get out of control like vinca and, or and, weeds. Yeah. And if you do have those, you have to go through every square foot. Right, you we're going to take you through every square foot. So this bed, there's a bed on either side of the stairs there, and they're full of quack grass. We did renovate the beds. We don't have the after pictures because we lost the job. We were fired for taking too long. Right. takes a lot of time to do it. Quack grass is not just an ugly thing in a garden. It actually stops the growth, slows the growth of the plants that it's around. It's what's called an allelopath, like Norway maples are and like sunflowers are. It creates chemicals that discourage the growth of other plants. So it's not a good plant to have in a garden. And quack grass has roots that are extend a long ways they can go down to nine inches and they can stay right near the surface and just keep running depending on its situation and every piece that you leave in even if it's a small piece can sprout and come up so you never till quack grass all you do is make more quack grasses when you do that. almost any running root you don't ever till and this garden happened to have bishop's weed bishop's weed that's that white edge leaf are you showing in there steve yep that's Bishop Sweet. Also called Snow on the Mountain. Bindweed. Bindweed. Canada, Canada Thistle. thistle yeah. And regular English And ivy. English Ivy, all in this garden. It was a terrible mess of running root plants. Coming over the wall from the neighbor, coming under the wall from the neighbors. That's coming, a wood fence. Right, there's a wood fence back there. Um, and the, the clients had just, they just thrown up their hands. What do we do with this area? It was a lot. That's Bindweed. Bindweed. We said, we're going to dig out the garden for you. 
and we're going to dig through every square foot. It's going to take us time to do because the bindweed's got very extensive roots and we need to get out as many pieces as we can. But we know we're not going to get it all. You, you just, just no can. way. Uh, the bindweed main root is much deeper than we can dig down to, and the others are fine roots. That's field bindweed that we had, hedge bindweed that we had in the beds. Um, so we're going to then come back every two weeks to and look for the pieces that come up. And you have to be every two weeks because if you wait longer, that they grow faster. They and, renew and their energy. As soon as they get leaves, they stop spending starch to come up and start making new starch. You need to get them as soon as they come up so that they have wasted starch coming from the roots and, and eventually you exhaust the roots. Yeah. Bindweed is a member of the morning glory family and it, people sometimes think it's a very pretty flower. We don't. Two other running uh, roots are Canada thistle and south thistle. They both run from the root. Not to be confused know. with bull thistle, which is a plant that stays in a clump and it grows as a biennial. I don't worry so much about bull thistle. And it's not just you. It's everybody. This is at a botanical garden where one of their beds has got Canada thistle running in it. It happens to everybody, and there's no secret answer. And this bed isn't face forward, so they, they let it go, and, and now it's going to take major renovation. Right. Um, and these are, we've talked to dozens of gardeners from big public gardens about what they do, and what they do is the same thing you and I do. They look at each other and go, what do you do about mine? But Because... There's no secret answer. There, is, there are some tips. It's persistence. Persistence and understanding that when a plant is coming into flower, it probably has less root than it has at other times of the year because it's putting its energy into the top parts of the plant. So although we're going to tell you that the best time to renovate is, is spring and fall, if you've got a bad problem with a running weed like Canada thistle, it may be best for you to make sure you attack it in summer when it's coming up to bloom. And this is coming up to bloom south thistle. See, the just, buds are just beginning yes, to open. Ready. That's the time when you're going to find less of the white root. And that's a thick white root when it's, start, when it's producing. It's not quite as thick as the flowers. So now you're going, to take, you're going to work through every square foot in the bed. And notice how the weeds develop. The bulbs are the worst. They're the hardest to get out over time because they keep you miss them. You, you think you get it when you pull that. There's that sitting down there and waiting. Okay, hang on a second because okay. you're going to dig through, you know, you can stay here. We're going to dig through every square foot and you're going to dig through knowing that this is the weed that you're looking for. Recognize what the roots look like because you're going to dig through every foot to take out all those roots you can get to. Nutsedge is like bulb plants, one of the worst to get out because the bulb can sit dormant. You need to know I'm after the nut not just the top part. Now this is what it looks like late in the year, but here's what it looks like in July when it's getting its flower on it, which is a, a whiskery thing. And the new bulbs are just being produced. They're so a lot easier to, to get when they have not formed fully. For that, that other bulb has deteriorated. It's used all of its energy. That's right, that's how bulb plants work. Use up the last year's bulb, build new bulbs. Scouring oh, rush. Gosh blooms first thing as it comes up. This is the leaf. The bloom came first, and that's when you needed to dig in. And know that the root you're looking for is that thick root. That's the storage root. The rest of it is all just stem, and people think they've got it. And you think you've got it, because you could pick a long piece like that, and there'll be two little pieces hanging, and you'll say, yeah, I got it. Yeah. And, uh, and this and scouring rush is a good example of why when you do renovate a bed, you need to restore the growing conditions and improve them. Usually when you have scouring rush, horsetail, growing in a bed, it's because you have a hard pan, a hard packed layer down in the soil a little ways, and none of the other plants are able to grow right down to that layer because water sits on top of it. Scouring rush can sit on top of it. So if you see this plant, you not only need to dig it out, you're going to need to pay special attention to the third step, improving the growing conditions. And getting weeds out, we have found over our time that forks work the best. It's, it's, so, when you use a spade, if you're digging, lifting up, you're going to cut root. You're gonna, the you're fork can rarely it. cut root. Yeah, yeah, usually with the fork, you can loosen and take the whole root yeah. out. And it works much better than 
get a small oh, fork. Yeah. If you want to use a small fork, then you can use a smaller fork, but the fork is going to help you loosen and pull out big leaves. And, and help you loosen an area and chase all, all of those roots out. Chase them, get them out. Yeah, running roots, you're going to chase the running roots. Um, um, and you feather them out. Yeah, something like quackgrass, you can put the fork in and bounce the fork, push down oh. on the handle to loosen and, and pull, the, pull that strong root right out. Now, when we say gar <clears throat> dig every square foot, you're going to take a break, Steve? I have to break. Okay. Um, when, you, when we say take out every square foot, you're basically going to take the plants out. The plants are out. Just take them out in clumps and set them to the side, and you're going to dig out the roots. You're going to go through and cut across the bed. You're going to cut a line across the bed, straight across, using a spade. That's a rectangular straight blade, not a shovel. A shovel with a curved blade is going to cut curves, and it's going to leave bits in the ground that you don't go through. You want to lift the whole thing. So you're going to cut across, then you're going to turn your spade at 90 degrees, and you're going to cut into chunks as big as you can handle, a square foot or square six square inches. But you're going to lift that, and you're going to take out all the roots that you find in there to get the roots out of there, and then you're going to back up and do the next area. This one's already dug. Now you're going to cut the next area. And you're always going to stand where you have not yet worked. Don't stand on the area you're working. Don't stand here and dig next to yourself. If you trample where you're working, you won't be able to tell what you've dug and what you haven't dug. And it's important to do every square foot and not leave those weeds in there. Remember, the plants are gone. They're out. They might even have weed, weeds in them. It's okay. Just set them to the side. If you have to leave a plant because it's really big and you don't want to move it, or because it, it's a tree and you're not going to move it, you can dig up to it, and I'll show you that a little bit later. If you dig with two people, don't try to dig in the same place. Dig two ends of the bed and just move toward each other. If you have two people, I guarantee they will walk on top of each other's work, and you'll end up with spaces that weren't dug over. That happened in this bed. Um, I thought I had a gardening company to work with that understood renovating beds, and they were to take out the old plants. I was coming in and at, a, at a Halloween with the new plants. When I got there, I was very disappointed to find that they had done, made the mistake of going to each spot where there was a plant. These are new plants that I've just put in. But they had gone to a spot where they could see where the plant was, and they had simply lifted out that plant. That left roots in the ground, and it also left plants that were dormant and bulbs that were in the... Um, so we still had to dig through everything a square foot at a time here. This information is on our website. We put all this up, thousands of articles that we think are helpful to people. This particular one is called Steps to Renovate Perennial Beds, and it's in, it's in What's Coming Up 67. So if you go to our website, and in our search field, you put in What's Up 67 or What's Coming Up 67, it'll return to you that issue, which will, will um, take you to that article. And that article has that particular PDF issue has um, quite a few articles in it, including how to, to reclaim a, a peony that's gone bad. We'll touch on that later. Yeah. It also has these diagrams, which your handout also has today. It has these diagrams that we're explaining to you. If you've got just a couple of areas in the garden, not the whole garden is full of weeds, but just an area where something is a little bit on the, on the uh, wild side, then go to the center of that colony and chase the runners outward. Don't start at the outside edge. The outside edge might be, for instance, where, where you see this one. Don't go there and just dig that one because you will miss those runners that haven't popped up yet. There's one coming toward the front, too. Go to where I'm holding the big ostrich fern, cut through the middle of the ferns, and chase outward from there. You're going to have much more success in doing these things. And if you have aggressive runners in the bed, everything you took out, you're going to wash the roots before you put it back in again. And, and inspect the roots. Make sure you, you know you've got the right roots out of there. Yeah, that's the main thing that people do is they put plants back in that are already infested. So we put in small pieces of pasta. This area filled up in no time at all. So with the crackgrass, we'll show you doing the crackgrass bed here. This is a big peony bed. We lifted out the plants that we decided to take out, uh, irises, lilies, 
Um, we left the peonies in place. This was the middle of June. We had only the weekend to work and not enough time to dig all the peonies, so I'll show you how we dealt with the peonies in place. We did not divide the plants when we first took right them away. out. We left them in clumps. When it came time to divide them, we took them all the way down to bare roots so that we could separate the quack grass roots that look a lot like iris roots yeah, and make sure, that we were, make sure we were putting back in. And when we put them back in, we put in a smaller amount, put in a quarter of what you took out. If you put in more than a quarter, the plant's going to double gonna in a year. And you're, it, it's as if you're, you're redoing it again. Yeah, you're going to have the plants crowded right away again. The peonies we left in um, because we didn't have the time to do them, and we'll show you about doing that. Um, we know, and you can know now too, that peony roots are two, four inches, that two to four inches down from the soil surface is where you've got the main roots. For the most part, the roots reach out to the edge of the peony clump out to the drip line. Um, and that quack grass runs horizontally, strong, it, not, not bunching like some grasses do. And what we had was peonies that looked like this, with grasses growing right in them. And we knew that was what we had under the ground. So what we did is we, we dug to the peony. So the peony has quack grass around it and in it. We, we did our cutting across the bed up to the peony all the way around, leaving the peony in an island with its quack grass. Then turned the, the shovel to cut radially and sliced in this way so that we could lift out these cheesecake pieces here, take the crack grass roots out, and that left a T on top of the roots that we could just pull the grasses out. Literally, you could pull those grass roots right out of there. Now that did cut some peony roots. You can see the cut ends, but we know that the peonies can take that, and they did take that and, and uh, dealt with it very well. We'll come back to that in a minute. When we get all done taking out aggressive plants, we say, did we eliminate the source? If we didn't, we need a root barrier. We need a way that they're not gonna run in again. And the metal barriers, they're hard to put in, they don't bend very well, and they all have holes in them. And where the, re the roots, roots are going to go. The roots are going to find those they holes. They find it, because where are you watering a lot and fertilizing are in your beds. So the roots are going to follow there. Um, we use carpet. There, there's reason for metal edging. It's good to hold in the underlayer for a, a, pay, a brick paper wall. Oh, away, for instance. The, there's reasons yes. for it, but not for a root barrier. We quite often, for a root barrier, in a grass like this, a lot, the lawn has quack grass in it. So we need a deeper barrier than just black diamond edging or that metal edging. We need a barrier that's about eight inches deep because that's how deep we found the roots running. So we're gonna use carpet runner. Um, we'll show you how we make that carpet runner, but in the background, you can just see a line. We leave the carpet runner up above ground, just about to the level that the mower mows, and then bring the soil back up to it. So this is carpet runner. You buy it in a roll, 27 inches wide, to go down a hallway that you don't want the carpet to wear out. And then you take a, a, a razor a knife and follow the line of nubblies and cut it. I'm making one 27 inch uh, piece of carpet runner into three nine inch. And then with a straight cut up and down, important that edging goes in straight up and down. Even the black diamond, even the metal. Right. You want it straight as you can get it. And we're gonna line it. And where, the, where, we, where a, a section runs out, we're gonna overlap by a foot as we put the next section in. You can ignore the tubing. That's um, as long as I was digging a trench there, I needed to take a drain tile out through the area so the drain tiles in there too. So the edging is now in in the bed that we cleaned out. It took the weekend to clean this bed out. It's about 70 feet long, 10 feet wide, about 700 feet. Um, we put edging in, that was 2010. Here's 2014, it's still quack grass free. This is maintained by a 90 year old gardener. 2010, when we got started, 2011, and now you can see the edging in the 2011 picture there. If you go back for a second, Steve. You know, you know, oh, I go back. back. So if you look down where the hose is crossing, see that line with the hose? That's the, the edge, the top edge of the edging that you can see there. It's 2011, it's still quack grass free. 2012, it's quack grass free. We're using straw, because she uses straw as a, as a mulch. Straw is a good mulch. Hay is, and it's got seed. Yeah, don't use hay, it's got seeds in it. 2014, still looking good. 2015, the Siberian iris is big. The irises, the bearded irises are big again. It's time now to renovate again. Think about renovating the pasture gardens. And again, you can find these at, in our what's what's coming up. This was in issue 99. Is reclaiming a garden, garden from grass. grass.
Now, if your plants are planted, all one kind of plant, and they're planted in rows, this is a cutting garden to cut Siberian irises, uh, is a cutting, and it's full of quack grass. It takes a little less time to renovate that because everything's in rows, everything's the same plant. So this area is about 100 square feet back to where my spade is stuck in the ground. Um, and it took about two and a quarter hours to dig that out, clear it out. The irises are, are uh, they're leaning over. That's all right, it's not gonna hurt the iris. And it looks a little messy because the only mulch that we had to use was leaves. And we took those leaves right off the tree. I think we might be in a situation where we're looking for mulch this year. Yeah, a lot of yeah, gardeners. A lot of gardeners might be. Um, yeah. If you've got aggressive plants, you might, even though you're doing a lot of digging, you might think about leaving the bed fallow, not planting it for a year, and smothering it. So you've got a really aggressive plant like uh, Phragmites, or like uh, someone asked about Japanese knotweed. These are plants that you dig out and pieces get left in there. Um, poison ivy is one that is a vine that grows on, runs on the ground. I'm not touching that poison ivy. I've got a, uh, a cloth next to me that I can show people. Here's what you've got to get out. We can dig out what's there, or you can kill what's there, but you're probably going to want to also wait and make sure that anything that comes back up, you take out of there. This is a bed that's full of Japanese anemone, 30 years worth of Japanese anemone allowed to run amok. Nobody controlling it along the way. Um, and yeah. we know how it grows. It goes right out. You follow the root right out to the drip line, and bam, the other one is coming right up. And then, we if know you're going that, close, you look close. We know that the crown is going to grow. Those are the buds for next year. But we also know that those are all along the, the roots. So any piece of the brittle root or the deep root that breaks off, we know is going to come back. So with Japanese anemone, we dug it all out, all that we could get a hold of, but we know we missed some. So we've also now, this bed is now going to sit from last August to, to next August, August. To, for a year. You wait a year. Right. With newspaper and mulch on top of it, and anything green that shows its head in there, we're going to kill. We're going to dig out and kill. Smothering, um, look up on our website for a, a complete description of smothering, but you're basically going to put down five to six layers, uh, four to five layers is good enough, sorry, four to five layers of newspaper spread out wide and overlapping the next newspaper by about a foot, just like you tie on the whole garden. And then add your mulch on top. Yeah. Make um, it at least two to three inches of mulch. Don't go. Yeah, you need to hold the paper down and you need yeah. to. Don't go too paper. light. Now, when you have rocks, there's rocks in the background there. When you have rocks, you're going to need to, to move the rocks or you're going to need to bite the bullet and cover those rocks with an uh, opaque, don't, not let's light through tarp or heavy paper. Um, I usually move rocks because it's easier to get the weeds out and know that they're gone. And but it you, is a lot of work. And when you're putting the rocks back in, you could plant right then. Right, I'm before. planting right so in those rocks. Plants are in along. before the rock is actually placed in that situation, not all the time. Yeah, so this bed has lines of rocks in it, but also a lot of weeds that have gotten out of control. So I've started digging at the bottom, dug over the whole area, moved the rocks, uh, rebuilt the ledge, I'm doing the next ledge, moving the whole thing out, that took about nine hours. It was like one long day of digging. And what we were digging out there was a plant called creeping bellflower. It creeps, it has running roots. And where those roots make a top, it then develops a tap root. And this was throughout the rocks. She was so happy when we were done. She was just, oh, now I can plant my garden again. Okay, and as we said before, our questions are, we're not going to stop for live questions here. We're editing those out of this particular um, uh, webinar. Sorry about that from the people that we talked to, but we need to save the time here. So we'll just look at a couple of pretty pictures. Okay, so now we're going to keep some plants on hold oh. because we had to make free space. Yeah. You know, that's right, it's yours, Steve. Yeah, you lift them up. Lift the, lift the whole plant up. This is a grass garden at a botanical garden that they, they're redoing. So they, they had quack grass, uh, bindweed in it. They lifted the plants up, set them on the tarp so no weeds will come up through while they're sitting there because they sat there all winter. They had to dig this whole bed out. 
And you're still in the process. And you don't the divide the plants ahead of time. Let them stay with their <clears throat> weedy roots. Let them stay intact and moist until you are ready to put them back in, and that's yeah. when you're going to clean them out. And when you're working with Peck, uh, Bishop Sweet, it's the same thing. You yeah. I'm digging out. Bit by bit. And we don't have to hold the plants long in this case because I'm digging out and throwing them in the buckets and handing them off to Lee and Don who are Wash. washing them out right in the oats so we can put them in. So sometimes you don't have to hold because you can clean them out and put them right back in in sections. With enough help. Because we cleaned it out, I knew that it was clean, we can start putting plants back in. Uh, that's called reclaiming neglected beds and what's coming up 129. Transplanting really large, slow-growing perennials. That happens. People that tell happens. us, yeah, people tell you you can't. Hey, you they supposedly can't transplant and bloom either, but yeah, we do. We, we you, move things. We could hold it in pots when you lift things up and transplant. Fall is a great time to do it. Right. And this is a baptisia. Yeah. And it took a while to dig, but it's taking longer to cut into pieces. Yeah, and to saw it into pieces. And so we actually held that one in soil because by the time you get it up, you've got an enormous yeah. root fall or you've got a bare root plant. And when you're digging the plants up, you also learn how to divide. Right. Make more of them. Don't right. believe what people yeah. say about don't disturb balloon flower. That's what this one is. Don't disturb baptisia. Don't disturb peonies. peonies. There's peonies. no reason. <laughs> if you couldn't disturb peonies, how could they grow thousands of them a year? Dig Millions them of them. Plant. Yeah. Right. Dig them up to, for us. Somebody's yeah. disturbing an awful lot of peonies somewhere. You could even do it with large, larger plants like small trees and shrubs. And, they're uh, perennials too. They they truly are. We dug this ginkgo up and took really good care of it. Put it over, mulched the area, kept it moist, and we moved it bare root and just put mulch on top we of the roots. We told you you'll be good. We'll put you back, and it's still there 14 years later. In some areas, you have to be very careful because there's electric, there's gas, there's uh, the sidewalk, the porch, the house. So the you're not saving as much root. You take as much as you can and cut and and lift it out and move it. So we've been we got up. it all tied up there to protect the branches. So we've been hemlock and the ladies moved it and placed it where they wanted it. Four years later, it's performing quite well. Thank you. Actually, and still doing yeah, well. It's probably 20 years later now, but yeah, it took about four did. years before it really took off after we moved it. Yeah, it struggled for the first two and a half, three years. And, this is a white pine that we lifted out, and we we had to lift out this way because the the root ball was was still on it, and we got it up and put it into into there. The so cage. you can you we can took the cage off things. once we got it out. Yeah, it's just how much you want to do. You tie up things, but don't tie them up too tight so that you break the limbs. If they're stiff limbs, be careful. And dig section. Start at the drip line. Work in and lift that plant out. You have to dig around the drip line and then you take some off yep. the roots until you can go under it. So now you go to step three, which is make the growing conditions better. Figure out what they are and either restore them to what they were or make them even better. And this is with the understanding that next to a building, next to a walkway, growing conditions can get pretty dicey. Um, these astilbes are beginning to wear because salt gets put on the walkway, people's feet stray off the walkway, snow gets stacked on top of it and compacts the area. Um, so when you take those plants out, you're going to have to put them back in in small pieces. And in this case, those small pieces, you can see them up there. Those small pieces are also important because you're not going to dig with about six to eight inches from the edge of that walkway. If you do, you'll undermine the walk. So you need to be placing small plants next to the walkway to preserve the walkway. And if you're going to do something like pack a sandra, you could do it in a checkerboard pattern. and and renewing it by taking out uh, a square foot or whatever size you want to do. Just take out all the black compost squares. And mulch and put and compost mulch. And that lets the plants that are in the white squares have a place to grow new roots and renew themselves. People don't renew their ground covers. They just let them go and go and go. And poor plants, are, are they get old. Um, a lot of times you have to say, I, I, I want to grow next to the building. And yet, it doesn't make sense to grow next to the building. We call it embrace the space. Mm. So here's, a, here's an area where you're looking at the house from the road. 
And that grass looks beautiful in front of the house. It's in front of the house. It's at the foundation. So are the sedums. But look again at where that grass is. It's just coming up in the spring. See it behind the sedum, Steve? You can see the miscanthus behind the sedum. There it is. There it is. Yeah. It's nowhere near the house. There's no reason to have to be right up against the house, right where it's dry, where you're disturbing the building. The plants don't need to be right up by the house. Look how beautiful this entranceway is that we redid. We made the entranceway larger, put a little patio by it, and we planted the plants out. And you have room to work on the brick, wash the windows, paint, do gutters, uh, or whatever you need to do there. And that's what it looked like before. And there's just no, there's reason, no reason that we should be fighting with our plants. And They'll spread back as far as they can spread, which is often right to the foundation if you plant them out a foot or two feet. Give yourself, give yourself a break. Give yourself some room in the garden. And think about all the room that's out here. Looking out from that front walk before we, or front entrance before we redid it, there was all that space. That's where we can put those plants and enjoy them out there and let them grow. At our house, we made decisions on paths, and then we decided what to take out. I just started ripping things out. This is, isn't that something we moved from a house where we had no lawn? To the first thing we started doing was ripping out everything but the lawn. But yeah. all of those things were crowded up against the house. And there was... Look, right against the foundation, right in front of the only windows. This is the, your approach to our front door. There's, lapping over the wall. That's not very inviting. Oops, sorry. That's okay. Um, we've had a lot of work to do on lowering beds, changing grade, putting in drains getting weedy things like Lily of the Valley out. So we're just getting ready in our third year now to really do our planting. But isn't the space better? Isn't it better to have that to look at than that, which is and what was there? Not only that, there's a window, window right there. here. And look what you used to see out that window. And even the cat didn't like it. Right. Cat loves looking out that window now. Out this window is underneath an overhang. It's dry as dust over there. It actually comes out about that far. Because of the eaves up above. It's just ridiculous that anybody thinks you need to grow there. So we decided oh, not right. to grow there. We had friends make, make us tablets, tiles. tiles that we, they planted stone and concrete. And we paved it with, with tiles that mean something yep. to us. Another thing we look at in restoring and improving growing conditions is looking at the drainage. Um, I'm talking about where the water drains onto the sidewalk and up to the house as one aspect of drainage, and I'm death on drainage. Yes. Look at that. So the soil is on the windowsill. And the, high. The bed is very high next to that. It was a built-up bed, and it's become even more built up. So we so. took that bed down. See, now we can see brick below the windowsill. At least two. And we've taken the bed down out by the tree. It was way high, way built up. Needed to come down. So that's going to drain water away from our walkways, keep ice off of our walkways, and also make it easier for plants to grow. Here's one where we're uh, lowering a bed. It, you, we're lowering two, this bed particularly to save that tree. In two weeks, we can tell you more right, about it. Right, you'll see more of this. But look how far down. I'm now kneeling at driveway level, um, but the bed was up at my hip level. This bed uh, is with the big maple tree in it next to a patio. The owners decided to take the maple out. If we'd lowered the whole bed, we would have had to take all the landscaping apart. So instead what we did is dug back toward the tree trunk and built a retaining wall so we could bring the water off of the patio, but still retain most of the rest of it. At this one, uh, we wanted to get the, house, the water away from the house, and, and when it slopes down, it was able to put some wood, some wildflowers that like the moisture, like the columbine and right. others that are in there. And with this walkway, we had to watch the drainage because this is compacted still. Where the, where the walkway used to be still has that hard packed soil under it. So we're going to stay six to eight inches away from the new walkway, but we need to break up that that uh, the drainage below. Don't go six to eight, don't go closer than six or eight inches from the walk because underneath the walk is, is, is gravel or sand or rubble or slag that's been compacted and it forms the base that holds up your walkway. If you dig next to that and take that soil and make it too loose, the gravel underneath will relax outward and you'll crack the edges of your asphalt, your walkway, your driveway. 
your pavers will roll over to the side. Don't, don't undo yourself. Gardeners are always undoing their heart structure. Here's an instance where um, those three are St. John's wort. They're all the same species, all the same type of plant. We put them in and they were all looking yellow like the two on the outside. I said, what is going on with you? They're supposed to look like that. Yep, I dug out the middle one and found that there was an old walkway under there, still under there. I took out three five-gallon buckets of rubble from under that plant, replaced it with soil, and put the plant back in. And this is the next year. Look at the color difference on the plant. It's a much better plant because it's got better drainage underneath it. And that's the other aspect of drainage. Drainage is what, where the water runs on top, but also how does it run through the soil. And how long does it take to run through the soil? You dig a hole 18 inches deep and fill it up with water. It should drain within 12 to 24 hours. If water's still sitting in it after a day and there's three inches of water in it, then you've got a three inch drainage problem and you need to raise the bed. If it's like this after two weeks, you raise the bed a lot. Yeah. And because, color. Yeah, color can tell you a lot about drainage. This is brown. That means there's oxygen in water going throughout. This is more blue-gray, not as much oxygen yep. going through and more of a problem. You see blue-gray, break it up. Break up blue-gray. Brown is maybe hard packed, but it's good stuff. You get compacted soil in old beds, and they often need to be broken up because you get foot traffic. Even just a little bit of foot traffic, or even dog run dog traffic can, makes a difference. The difference here, see the difference in the sedums. These are lighter colored. There was a basketball hoop and they would play in the ball and would bounce in there and get stuck and the people would walk in there. It got compact. It's compacted and that one plant is not to grow as well. This is compaction. That's how we think is, boy, that's going to be really compacted, but that can compact the soil more. We have more pounds per square inch pressure from our feet than on that machine. Especially when you step up on your tiptoes to reach something. You're putting more pounds per square inch than a bulldozer. So look for the places where people have walked and loosen that soil and loosen it deep. Make sure that the plants get the drainage to 18 inches. And protect soil where you walk back and forth at the continuous way or if you were wheelbarrowing you could lay out wood like that. Yeah, protect the soil. Protect it and compact it. When you dig it and lift it up it's going to it's going to it's raise, going to raise the, it. It's going it's, to raise the bed. You're adding air. You're adding pockets of air if all you, through there. If you don't want to raise the bed, you can take the excess off. What you take off is equal to the amount of air you dug in. Um, so you can take that off. She didn't want to take it off. And you don't have to break it up. Certainly don't till it. Big chunks like that are wonderful. Plants will love to grow in that. They like that space or root, root, root growth in water. Your mulch and your compost that you put on top are gonna to fall into those They'll spaces fall, right? and decay in there. It becomes a wonderful bed. We're using Excelsior as mulch and compost there because the owner happened to have a lot of wood shavings. Sometimes you, you use what you've got. Yeah. If you're making the soil better and the garden better among tree roots, remember that if the tree's a keeper, um, you're going to take the plants out that aren't suited and you might just be loosening the soil with a fork, but not digging everything. So this tree was very important, is very important in Margaret's garden. Uh, we had an arborist take a couple of limbs off and, and thin the top, but just like the other Sally's that we showed you, that patio is built. It's elevated. It's, it's on, top on top of we didn't the roots. Dig down. Did not dig the roots. Um, everything looks chunked up here. That's not done with the rototiller. That's us with forks loosening and taking out the weeds that were in there and being careful even though they were trash trees mulberries and hackberries we decided they're important trees in that garden yep. the zoo. and for the sake of your new plants don't cut the roots of the trees where you cut a root it's going to branch and if branch new, multiples yeah if your new plant is right there and that tree branches into it with a million leaves of energy it's going to outcompete your plant so don't cut roots you don't have to cut and if you have to cut roots from the tree, there's an eight inch diameter tree back there. Eight feet from the tree is as close as you want to cut a major root. One foot away from the tree for every inch of trunk caliper. That's diameter. And we had that on our... We, uh, we had to lower this bed. We showed you along our walkway. This is a service berry. The service berry was planted way deep. And just like the spruces that we showed you earlier, it was developing roots that were wrapping around the trunk. We took those off, but uh, we we smothered. Can you go back to that for a minute, Steve? Oh, I've got the back. Um, we smothered most of the, the 
lily of the valley in the bed because we it's important to us that that tree does well the roots you see wrapped up or some grapevine i've got stored there Okay, after you've loosened around the tree, then you're going to add some compost. Don't stack it against the trunk, don't, don't pack it down, and you're going to plant small, forage pots, bare root plants, things that are not going to have to disturb a lot of root to go in. If you need to plant some big things in your focal points, you can plant a couple of big plants, but for the most part, little plants, water them well, they grow, and they fill in. And they look good. That secret in this garden is not the small, but you have to water. Water will do later. Planting small. It took two years to fill in. Don't do it too much or it'll go past. Here we go. It took two years to fill in, but it did fill in. Pruning is something you need to do. If you're working around tree roots, you need to think about pruning the tops of the plants. You need to let light in. The mulberries is something that you have to prune every year because it grows so fast. You look up and say, now where did that branch come from? Because right. it's blocking your light. You need to keep the light in. And light is something that changes and we don't notice that it gets dark. Some depths, this big maple here with the leaves hanging in made that shade area very dense. We, same garden, same area, trees still there. We, we had it limbed up, an arborist came. And did a beautiful job. beautiful job of opening it up and still having the tree there and believe me there was a lot of trees still there yeah. sometimes you get more light in by taking trees out and this was inadvertent that hank and sharon's garden there was a blowdown behind it and eight trees came down and that's something you cry about but then you look and say wow look how much more light is coming into the garden and it was bringing it's coming in. in before yeah And there's service berries with multi trunk multi things trunks. and bushy things. You can thin them out right from ground level. Our own service berry, we've taken three trunks out so far because it looked like that. And we still have one trunk to go. We'll show you where it is here. You take a look. We're looking for trunks that are not necessary. You know how many more trunks there are? Those two. And if you look at those two from down here and look up, do you see that they're both trying for the same part of the sky? One of them can go. And the one we decided, I guess we can go middle. back to the one. The one that's coming out is the one in the middle because as the other tree, other trunks gain in diameter, they're gonna squeeze that trunk out. So we might as well take that one. Lets a lot more light in without hurting the plant. We let a lot of light in, taking out the river birch back in the corner with the light colored bark. We took out the crab apples against the white uh, stone building. We also work with the city to keep the linden trees out here pruned. They're so, limbed much higher now. Yep, they're on the south side of the garden. So it started out as the dark, the valley of darkness, we called it. And just you, taking even, things out. You yeah. can tell the lightness. Yeah. We're able to grow a lot of plants in an hour and a half of light in there. And shrubs, you're pruning shrubs. We've talked for three weeks about different kinds of pruning to make more room. Here we go. Hello, Mr. Leonard Caterpillar and Eastern Yellow Swallowtail. I hope you enjoy these pictures as much as we do, because we sure do. You're yeah. right, it's Chief Joseph Pine. So we're now into the last step, which is finding new plants, planting them so that things get established quickly, and making sure that you have really good impact on your plants. That's where we are in the handout. We're on page two, replanting. What you want is new plants and new features, and you want stuff that's good for this time around. You're an experienced gardener now. You've got an older garden. You don't want just any old plant. Go look. Yeah. And you find, want spectacular. Find the spectacular one. Say, man, that is a great plant, that zebra iris. If you've got good growing conditions for it. You don't even care about the flower. Yeah, who forest. cares? If you're growing hibiscus well because you've got moisture and sun, Look for plants that grow with hibiscus, like liatris that grows with a straight up leaf and a lavender that's mounded, both of which have smaller leaves in the hibiscus and look great together. Um, if you're growing turtle head, then pearly everlasting is a good native plant to go with it, gray and mounded with upright and green, great combination. If you're growing hellebores with their big leaves, big deep green leaves, maybe you need to have a smaller, lower plant that carpets the ground with white, like white Nancy Lanian. You've got a 
a selection of plants in here. There's not just hosta, it's a mold texture to go with the finer texture of the Japanese maple, various shades of green, and the really fine of the forget me not in the front. But it's not just hostas. It's all yeah. different plants no, with big was, leaves in there. Yes. We, we, we moved the purple leaf plant in in order to take advantage of the wormwood, the artemisia that's gray. Right. And when we changed it, we also added gray in front of it. The Himalayan sank fog foil is gray in front of it so that we got a better look, different heights, different colors at that end of the bed. We took out the really big crocosmia coming up to the walkway at Sue's and, and put in better, longer interest plants in the front edge, um, including a ground cover here. That ground cover with the lighter color leaves is called Border Jewel. Polygonum affini. This is what it looks like in the winter. Not truly an evergreen, but beautiful in the winter. Here's what it looks like in November. It's been blooming for most of the summer and fall. White spikes that turn pink and then red. That's called border jewel. Blue star amsonia is a great clump forming plant because you don't want to invite in the runners. Ground cover pinks. No. Beautiful plants. Plant. Beautiful great evergreen, foliage. blue foliage. If you've got sun and well drained soil, it's a great long lived plant. Don't let the books fool you. Ladies' mantle and rogersia. Rogersia is one of my favorite plants because I love the big, bold texture, but then the flowers are so fine. Yeah, it's, it's a, just, and these are both great where it's, it's shady and, or part shady and the soil is moist. If you've got perennial fountain grass with those fine leaves and the, the mounded texture, then you're going to look for things to go with it, like gas plant that's more upright. And that is a clump forming plant you can leave in. You're looking for things that love your conditions, what your old garden has, whether that's half shade or you've got a drought situation. Um, you're going to need to plant, pick for those conditions. So in, in this garden around the corner from where we showed you the euonymus and grass garden being changed, we had barberry, eh, not a good yeah. thing for people with bathing suits. And uh, we took those out. We said we can find other plants that are better in the sun and wind, like blue star juniper and the uh, zebra iris and butterfly bush, the, the dwarf, dwarf butterfly bushes. So go for it. Go for better plants this time around. And don't invite the things that run. Don't do it. You just took them out. Yeah. Um, we couldn't quite get John and Nancy to give up stelladoros. I said, you know, you've got so many stelladoros, they multiply like rabbits, and they're not pretty plants when they're not blooming. We kept, and so here they are, we kept one clump. The rest we took out and replaced with plants that are more, that have a longer lasting interest. Peony right next to it that looks good when it blooms and still looks good in the fall when the butterfly bush is blooming behind it. And so when the, peony, the daylily gets to its ragged state, we don't have a whole line of ragged plants. We've got some that are looking good for other reasons. And for heaven's sake, throw, throw them out. out. Throw them out. If there are plants that you said are not right for you, throw them out. Put them at the end of your driveway. Let somebody take them home. And don't bring them back in if nobody takes them. <laughs> we're, just, we're just so awful gardeners. When we're planting, we want it to look new and wonderful right away. So you want to spread the roots, get them to establish quickly. So spread the spread roots them. wide. Make wide poles. As far as the roots go this year, that's as far as the plant's going to go. Um, divide because younger plants grow quicker. We put in little pieces, look at them, they're little pieces. And they fill that area. And they grow so much more vigorously when they're young. This is a piece, just one piece of the Violet Queen uh, Monarda that's just downhill. That I took that one piece and moved uphill. This is the next year. Look at the daughter plant, how much taller it is, how longer it blooms longer. Bigger blooms. It's more, got more leaves. Less stems. It's not, it's not a, a disease problem on the old one. It's just gotten so crowded over. over the years that it can't grow leaves down there and keep them down there. Plants need to be divided. Even the ones that live a long time are going to be bigger, healthier uh, when you divide them. And check the level when you put things in. Check the level of things that were put no in before. Again. There's no flare on that ginkgo tree. And it's and got sucker. suckers. Ginkgos shouldn't sucker. The, uh, the flare roots are a good eight inches down, and there is a root going right across, girdling the trunk. And that's why the suckers are right above it, because it's being girdled. Put mulch on. 
fine mulch we like and if you don't have enough mulch you could lay some newspaper down not as thick as when smothering yeah this is and not a smothering layer we're just put opening a up veneer of mulch on. yeah so you lay a little bit of newspaper on a pad in that area and then then thin layer of mulch, thin layer of mulch and it, will, it will work it's a good way to make your mulch stretch and don't please don't use okay. fabric uh, every hole lets weeds through. The roots, it, so the weeds the, grow on top of it. They yeah. grow underneath it. They grow on top of it. They grow around it. They, it's, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Just don't put fabric on. Just no. don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. It doesn't allow exchange for nutrients and everything. Yeah. So, and weed. especially for buying weed. Then you're going to arrange your new plants to make sure that they look best. I'm going to take this one. Yep. Um, I'm going to refer you to our book, Designing Your Gardens and Landscapes, because we're just going to go through this very quickly. The idea is that you put in a plant of the ones that you've chosen to keep or the new ones you've added. You're going to put in a plant, and then you're going to choose other plants to grow with it that will keep that plant looking outstanding. We call it framing. In this garden, we framed main plants, the main plants being the uh, beach spruce in the background so around the beach go plants that are green around the purple leaves around the spruce that's blue go green plants with with uh, reddish tips we're looking at a focal point here in this garden we're going to renovate this garden and put a garden where there's been lawn we're playing right now with how big the focal point should be it's not going to be a wheelbarrow we're just saying is that big enough is that line good and once we figure that out, then those blue statues are that thing, drawing your attention to that space. And the fact that they are there and blue and there is a surrounding of darker green around them keeps them outlined, keeps them framed. So at this house, we put in the tree and framed it with low plants. The grass should not still be there. It was supposed to only be there till the tree grew up, but they love the grass. The hydrangea, is framed with the low green and the low purple. And if you put things in arranged well, the walkway's in the right place, the tree's in the right place, the plants are well, are well done, then 10 years later, you still can look at it and say, I like it. There it is, there it still is. I don't have to move the fence, I don't have to change the walk, I just have to deal with the plants, with the soil that's built up in a higher level. You can live in that garden. The time to do these things is, is spring and fall, and you can phase it in. We're now on tips. Yeah, that's in uh, a Vale at the Betty Ford Garden, and they were redoing a garden. They were doing just what we've been talking about. They lifted the plants up. My grandson was very interested in all the tools. He wanted to go over and see what they, yeah. what they are doing, and they, they removed every plant, and there were lots of them. Lots of plants that we moved, and we, Janet and I went and found them. They just dug them up and stuck them in containers, stuck them by themselves, labeled the ones that they would have trouble finding, remembering what they were. There's lots of alpines, lots of plants. In Some of them aren't even in containers. They're just clumps, just, They're just sitting there. Sitting there, so waiting, this, waiting to go. This is what you do. Uh, Virginia wanted to have things look a little better looking out her bedroom window. I said, we can't really do the whole woods, Virginia, but we can do the front edge. And so what we did here is we're phasing it in. We'll do more back into the woods as time goes on. When I dug it, I dug, um, whoops, I guess we both changed it. Yeah. Hang on, I'm going to change back. I dug the front edge free of all weeds and reset the plants. And behind that, smothered to kill because we have a running root plant in there called Enchanter's Nightshade. It's a native plant with burrs, but those roots break off every time. Very easily. And just come back, and also garlic mustard. So we're going to need to work on that a little at a time, but we can make it look good right away. It's easier to do in September and in April, but you can, you can do any time. It's just gonna take you more time. I'm putting in a new beach in this garden, and it's in the middle of the season, so I need to get back in there for some reason I'm not advancing, there we go. Um, and I need to get up that hill with that plant, so I take the Japanese painted fern out of the way, in clumps, set them to the side, tie up the hostas, plank a place so I'm not gonna mess up the soil, bring the tree up, get the tree in, 
put the plants back in, and that was six and a half hours, a lot longer than it takes when you can cut plants down and move them around. Mm -hmm. You can also do things during the year, so during June when Mildred said, it's just it's too crowded, I just need more. I said, well, we, I, I can't dig them all up and divide them right now. There's not time, and they would look a little off. I went through, and in 20 minutes, I took leaves out to temporarily make the plant smaller, like so to like so. Just reach down in with a knife and cut the okay. whole eye out where the leaves were coming from. It can help to divide things into rooms to phase it in. So you can say, I'll do in front of the shrubs and then I'll do the back part. You can do the whole bed. You could do the front edge of the bed and the back edge of the bed separately. You can put up a wall, temporary or permanent, and do the inside of the wall separate from the outside of the wall. Um, if you're looking from your patio at our old garden, um, just off the lawn there, then you really don't see through that garden when it's grown up to behind it. So you can renovate anything behind it as a separate room from anything out in front of it. So now it's all replanted. And what questions do we have about replanting? Not, not many, no. not many. People were overwhelmed. Yes. Then you're just gonna take care of it afterwards. Watering is gonna be your big thing. You need to know where it's coming from and either and how long the soil stays moist. We water, and in almost every botanical garden, we've, we've worked with the gardeners there to see what they do. They water with a, a gardener attached to a hose. They fill up the, the uh, watering levee, the ring that you've made to hold water around the plant. That gets the water where it belongs. You're not then feeding that Norway maple by going overhead mm -hmm. across those, beach, those birches back there. You're watering just the plants that need the water. At Russ and Ginny's underneath the big maple, Russ said, well, I'm not going to do that. I said, then let's put in a soaker hose. And we talked Ralph into, or Russ into, connecting the soaker hose with its pressure regulator. The, when you buy a weeper hose, it comes with a pressure regulator. Most people throw it away not knowing mm -hmm. what to do with it. Put it in the hose, put it on, fill up the hose, and then back your spigot off to where it's just barely running. And turn it on in April. Turn it off in October. Russ kept track because he was very, very particular about that. He spent no more money on water, letting it drip the whole season than what he was spending with moving a sprinkler around on and watering the top and the tree as well as the stuff on, on the surface. So there's your watering rings. On a hill, you're going to slope the, the area. So you're going to, what we made here was we made lines that caught the water and sent it sideways and then sideways so that the water followed a zigzag pattern down the hill rather than running straight down and bringing the mulch and everything else down onto the deck. Now, we moved this tree from over there to over here and we told them anytime it's over 70 degrees, set a sprinkler out there and hey, cool that tree off. Especially during the middle of the day. The tree made it just fine. Yeah. So did this guy. With its little bit of roots. That little itty -bitty we, we moved it in the summer of 1995, and that winter in 95 96, we had a, a huge anomaly 70 degrees for three or four days, and then 22 below. And I went and I talked to that tree the next morning. And and look at it. It's still there. It, still there. It made it nicely. Yeah. You also need, with follow up care, to make sure when you're doing your renovation to watch what might go wrong. Um, if you have insect or disease problems, when you put small plants in, you may find insects like this black vine weevil. The adult eats the leaves. We wrote about it in, in, in gardening in, in what's, what's up, coming 67, up 67. 67, do a search for black vine weevil. But if you were digging like out your bed those little guys. and you found those guys in the spring, you go, oh, I have black vine weevil. They look like that. And then, and then as they metamorphose, there's one beginning to turn into a beetle. Those are the things that eat the roots, and if you put in young plants, they're gonna eat the plants at a, because you, there's a population there that was living on bigger plants, you might lose your little plants. Yeah. So disease problems, insect problems, this one's a disease problem on the monk's hood. The roots have become infected. You can tell when you dig them up that they feel soft in some places. You need to get rid of the bad stuff and keep the good stuff. You're not gonna cut apart the roots yourself. And I cut that apart so that you can see it's good inside. If you have peony botrytis, 
You're going to know you have peony botrytis by the dark stains on the leaves. The next year, you must make sure that you protect those leaves from the fungus that you just moved with them because the plants got to recover and usually can't handle that. If you look in, uh, in our What's Coming Up, you'll find that you've got um, uh, peony botrytis there and you can look it up. Um, we moved our pearly everlasting. It's blooming white there in the center background because it was getting shady. We had a huge population of painted uh, of American lady butterflies, which we love having, living on that pearly everlasting. And we moved it to the front yard in small pieces. We had to protect the plant for the first year because there were so many butterflies in our yard that those small plants couldn't handle it. They were getting they were, eaten down to nothing. Yeah. So watch for your pest problems. And then for heaven's sakes, have patience. Be patient. Don't fill between your new divisions and new plants with annuals. That's like planting weeds. If you want to have annuals in a garden. They do the same thing as a weed. Yeah, if you want to have annuals in a garden, Sorry. then do what we did here. We took out the ground cover and put in a garden. Leave space that you leave for annuals. Um, when you put things in, so we've put in the big plants first in this garden that were smothering around the tree, and then we followed back in afterwards on with the ground covers, and we put them each in their own place, left room, left space, and they all filled in. It's a beautiful garden. We keep digging things up before they can even become full here, but we left spaces for the annuals and the bulbs because there will be annuals and bulbs every there year will in be this bulbs, garden. Definitely. So don't be discouraged. We look at things and sometimes have to think, oh, well, how will this ever happen? But it can look beautiful when you get done. You can go from really needing it to coming back every two weeks and finding That's the pieces that you little pieces little pieces see that little piece this, got left in this one was almost done it's yes. that little bit if we clip that green even if we just cut the green that might be the end of that piece but these pieces still have a ways to go so, in there that corner with the bindweed you might even have to talk to the neighbors to make sure that you can keep it out from the neighboring areas Okay, so um, look, go out now and work on your high visibility areas right there by your entranceway. I don't know if you could even see that that arbor was there. But that arbor, I'm going Oops. to go back and see. But you want to work on areas that you see all the time, like here where you come into your driveway. Can you see the arbor? Point it out where it is, Steve. There's the arbor, but you can't even see it. Once you renovate that area, you will feel better. It's only 100 square feet. It's only going to take you about 10 hours. So that's a weekend's work to get that done. And you will feel so good. You can move to the low visibility area afterwards. Feel better. Yes. Now, if you have questions, um, you can take them to our website. It's very easy to get a hold of us on our website at gardenatoz.org. Or you can go to our forum right off of gardenatoz.org and post your questions where we put questions and answers that everyone can read. We hope you've enjoyed this webinar. We'll be here every Saturday. We have, uh, at this point, a couple more in our free trial of webinars. And after that, it's a subscription service, so get in while you can. Books are available if you ask for booksellers to get them. They're still in print. They're in print, yeah. Those two. Yeah. So, and so go give it your best shot. It's up to you. It's really nice talking to you this morning. Uh, we'll talk to you another time. Join us at GardenAtoZ.org. Go to webinars. You can download the handout, and you can also find information about the upcoming schedule. Thanks a lot. Top for now.